Heavenly Father, we're so honored once again to be able to gather together uh, to worship you, to be able to uh, lift our voices uh, with music, and uh, it's sweet for us to hear, but I know it's sweet for you to hear as well. And Lord, I just pray that as we open your word this morning, God, teach us, open our hearts. Lord, I pray that if there's someone that's in this room or watching online, that does not know Christ as their Savior, Lord, that today might be the day that their life and their eternity is changed forever. We love you. We thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. Bless this time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 is where we will spend all of our time this morning. Um, You've heard of this thing called a missed opportunity, right? Everybody knows what a missed opportunity is. Uh, so I'll give you just a hypothetical of a, of a missed opportunity. So, so hypothetically, suppose there was a toilet paper production company in Dallas that overproduced um, their toilet paper by 2 million rolls in December. And as a result, they ran out of money, they went bankrupt, and they ended up selling their entire inventory of toilet paper for 5 cents per roll And then the coronavirus hit. And stores couldn't keep toilet paper on the shelves, right? And we would say about that that hypothetical company, man, what a missed opportunity. Or there used to be this thing on that you could watch on TV called baseball. And and so like at at the, the first batter in inning gets up and he hits a triple, right? And then the next three batters all strike out. The announcer would say, man, that was a missed opportunity opportunity. Today I want to share a message with you titled, When Opportunity Knocks, and it comes from what's known as the parable of the great banquet. We've been spending our time this summer talking about the parables of Jesus, and in a parable, Jesus takes something that that the listeners would know to share with them, to teach them a spiritual truth that they did not know. And so Jesus is telling about a man who prepares a, a great banquet. That's something that people would know. And he's, he's teaching the, the spiritual truth that they don't know of about the opportunity that, that mankind has to be invited into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning, this parable shows us three things about the opportunity that's presented to every person for salvation. And before we see those, let's begin reading in verse 16, Luke chapter 14, verse 16. So Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. So here's the first of the three things that we see as we apply them to us. The prep work for salvation has already been done. I Sometimes when I give you bullet points to kind of give you the main ideas, I address them specifically about about what the teaching is in the parable to the people of that day. I wanted to apply it to us today. Uh, and so that's how I am wording these. The prep work for salvation for us has already been done. Now, Jesus used many different things to picture birth, uh, or to picture salvation. Birth is one of them, right? When Jesus said, you must be born again. He was talking using birth to talk about salvation. He used sheep when he talked about that there were 99 in the fold, but one was lost, and he went after the one, to, the shepherd went after the one. That's talking about, he's making a point about salvation. Uh, to, today, in this parable, Jesus uses food as a picture of salvation. And I told you, Jesus uses earthly things that people knew about in order to teach spiritual things that they didn't know about. And if there's anything that all of us ought to know a little something about, it's food. I mean, look, I understand biologically about people being born, but I've never delivered a baby. And while I've had pets, I've never had to go looking for a lost sheep. But I have a very intimate, first-hand knowledge about food, and you do too, because let's be honest, we haven't missed a whole lot of meals. We understand food. It's, a, it's an illustration that we can identify with. And all of us have attended sometime in our life some type of big feast. So whether it was Thanksgiving or maybe a family reunion picnic or something like that. And what we know is, is those types of events require a lot of preparation that has to happen beforehand, before the feast, before the event can even happen. So, so let's just use those two examples, Thanksgiving or a family reunion picnic. 
let's say that you're the host and you've decided that this year you're going to provide everything. You're doing it all. There's a lot of work that has to happen leading up to that event, right? Because first, you have to find out how many people are going to be there. And so you got to, you know, get to all the family. Say, hey, how many are coming? you got to know how many mouths to feed. Then you gotta, you got to plan a menu. And then you got to go get all the paper products. And you got to make sure you get ice to cover, you know, for all the people. And you got to have the cups and the drinks and, and just decide what food you're going to that you're going to cook, and, and then you got to go to the store, and you have to buy everything, so there's a great expense. And then you have to come back, and if you're using a propane grill, you got to make sure you have a propane, or you got to have enough charcoal and all this. And then you got to, on the, on the days leading up, you start preparing the potato salad and the beans and, and the deviled eggs, and then you get out on the grill on the day of, and you start preparing all of this stuff, and there's just a lot of work that goes into it. And what kind of family reunion would you have without ice cream? See, the generation before me, you know that there was a lot of preparation that went into ice cream, right? Because you had to crank that baby. You had to crank the ice cream freezer, right? That's the generation before me. My generation, we didn't do that. We plugged it in. Generation after me, they just get some bluebell. Right? Less and less prep with the ice cream. But, but there's lots of prep work that goes into for the big feast. And so this man is preparing a great banquet, a great feast, verse 17. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. So the man prepared the food for the banquet. He sent word to those that he had invited, and look what he told them. It's the last four words of the verse. Everything is now ready. This wasn't a potluck banquet where everybody was having to bring their own stuff. Everybody didn't have to go and do their own work and then bring it to the host. The host did all the work. And here's the spiritual truth that Jesus is teaching us with this. All the work that needed to be done in order for people to be saved, it's already all been done. There is no work that you have to perform to get to heaven. There are no good works that you have to achieve to get to heaven. Jesus paid all of the price. He did all of the work when he went to the cross of Calvary. That's why he said before he drew his last breath, it is finished. See, for every person who has been saved or who will be saved, all the prep work has already been done by Jesus. Everything is ready, he says, and it's ready now. That leads us to the second thing that we learn in this parable, that we're all invited to be saved. We're all invited. Verse 16, let's look at these two again. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet. He invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come. When I got married, um, we, we planned the date that we were going to be married, and we sent out one piece of mail. It was the wedding announcement slash invitation now there's at least one other one that gets sent out first right it's called a save the date and so people now send way ahead of time they send a save the date it doesn't have all the details it just is saying okay october the 5th this is the day we're getting married that's all you need to know for now right um and we have the idea that this is a, a, a new development. It's not a new development at all. As a matter of fact, that's exactly how these types of events would have happened in the Bible. So when a, when a man in the time of Christ prepared a banquet such as this, he would send out, save the dates if you would, to, to the guests. And their responsibility was to RSVP, to let him know. And here's why. Because he couldn't just run to the store day of and get all the stuff he needed to prepare for such an event. And so all the people would RSVP and tell him whether or not they were coming or not. And so he knew how to prepare. He did all the work. He knew how many animals he would have to butcher. He, he did all the work, had the food ready. And then on the day of, when he was a couple of hours away from having everything done, he would send his servants back out and say, all right, everything's going to be ready at 5. So, so, so be there at 5. But watch what happens. Verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. 
Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. These people that are, that are saying these things are people that had already RSVP'd, saying that they had the intentions of coming. And so the host did all this prep work for them so that they didn't have to do anything except show up. It's a free meal. It's hard to understand why someone would get invited, say they were coming, and then reject the banquet that was free and fully prepared. But these people did, and they began to make excuses for why they weren't coming. The first guy says, I bought a field. You know, the truth is, is in the world we live in today, some people do buy property sight unseen. But that was not something that you did in Jesus' day. And here's the reason. Property was the most valuable asset they could ever have. And once they bought a piece of property, it stayed in their family for generations. And so no one bought property sight unseen. They would go and they would want to know everything there was to know about the property. Does it drain right? Does it have access to water? Are, are we going to be able to, to, to graze cattle here or whatever? So they knew everything about it. This person had seen the land, and he had seen it many times because that was the process of buying land back then. He's simply making an excuse. The next guy says, well, I've bought some oxen, and I need to go try them out. Um, some of you may have done this. I, I don't think I could do it just, just because I'm just not wired that way. But, you know, nowadays, you can purchase a car and not even test drive it. Um, and there are several places that you can do that from. The first one that I knew of is called Carvana. Carvana, you go to their website, and they'll show you all the pictures of everything, the price, the whole thing. You never test drive it. You never even put, put a finger on it. You just look at it, and if you say, that's the one I want, if you want it you know, for the full experience, they'll give you like some kind of little token or something, and you go to the Carvana car vending machine. I don't know if you've seen this or not. There's one over off 121 in Frisco. It's a big about four or five story glass building and it's got cars in it and you go up and if your car is in there you put the little token in and your car it spins and it drops down like a candy bar does in a vending machine right i don't think i could do that but i get that some people do but there was no such thing as oxvana back then you didn't buy a team of oxen that you hadn't already test plowed with. It would be like spending the, the uh, huge sum of money to go buy a tractor to plow with, and you didn't even know if it had enough horsepower to, to pull the implements. Again, they're just making excuses. And then the third guy says, I just got married, and I'm just going to resist all of the humor that's in my head over this one and just, just move straight on. They're making excuses. And when we make excuses like these did in, res, in, in, in respects of, of, of God offering salvation to us, what happens is, is we're settling for second best. Look, there was nothing wrong with owning land. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with, with purchasing oxen. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with getting married. That's a good thing. But here's the deal. When we let good things get in the way of experiencing the best thing, those good things become bad things. Each of these were invited to the banquet. They RSVP'd that they were going to come. They had good spiritual intentions. But when it came time to actually accept the invitation, they let excuses get in the way. And many people are doing the same thing with salvation today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that the Lord doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants everyone to come to repentance and be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. It's not that the planet that he's talking about. He, did, he didn't send his son to die on a cross for a planet, but for the people of the planet. And so it, it goes on to say that whoever believes will have eternal life. Everyone is invited, but many are making excuses. And for most, I think that this is, this is what's on their mind. I, in, in the parable and in life today, I think these people in the parable, they were like, well, I don't, I'm just not feeling it today. I'd rather do something else. But 
but I'll go the next time he invites me. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing with salvation today. I think that they hear the gospel message. They hear about the fact that they are sinners in need of a Savior. And, and, and they hear that Jesus died on the cross. And that sounds good. And that's something that, that they want. But they make excuses. And the rationale is, is, well, I need to get this done first. I need to get this in line. I need to get this taken care of first. But next time I get this invitation, I will be saved. But here's the thing, and it's the third thing that we see in this parable. Those who reject salvation may not get another invitation. Those who reject salvation, may, I didn't say they will not, it's not a definite, but they may not ever get another invitation. Look at verse 21. The servant came back and reported about the excuses that they were making, and the owner, the host, who had done all this work, became angry. Verse 24, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. First of all, let's, let's don't focus on the, what what. Jesus is teaching us, let's just focus on the story. Do you blame the host at all for feeling the way he feels? Absolutely not. All the prep work he did, all the cost, he's insulted and he's angry, and we don't blame him one bit. But remember, this is a parable that Jesus is using to teach us a spiritual truth, and it is this, God has prepared salvation for mankind. All the prep work was done, and Jesus paid the full price when he went to the cross of Calvary. And when people reject God's gracious invitation to be saved, they reject the death of his son, and it makes God angry. And this, this, may, be, this may be head exploding for some of you, because maybe you've been raised in church for so long, and you're like, well, you know, God is love, God is love, God is love, and God is love. But the Bible shows us many examples of God also having a righteous anger. And it's on display here. If people reject God, they may not get another invitation. Their excuses for rejecting salvation through Jesus, if that happens, will best be described as nothing less than a missed opportunity. You know, when, when the host in the parable, when he was rejected by his guests, do you know what he did not do? By the way, I, I think that not only are the things that Jesus includes in, in these parables to, to give us a, a, an understanding of a greater spiritual truth, not only are the things that are included important, but the things that are not. Because what the host did not do was he did not send another invitation just to make sure that they understood. He also did not go to their house and beg them. What he did do was he gave their invitation to somebody else. Look at verse 21. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Again, the excuses. And the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. And the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Why did he extend the invitation to those others? Because the goal from the outset was for the house to be full to share the banquet with them. So he said, these people that, that have rejected, that's fine. Not begging them. Take the invitation and go out in the streets and lanes of the city. You know who you find out in the streets of the city? The street people. The homeless, the unloved, the unlovable, the lonely, the undesirable. One reason that some people reject salvation through Jesus is because they think that they're not right yet. They, they got to get right. 
And here's the thing. When we think that, when we think that way, what, that, what we're saying is, is I have to do some prep work. But the prep work for salvation has already been done. There is no level that you have to get to as a human being in order for Christ to save you from your sin. As a matter of fact, when he died on the cross for the purpose of forgiving sin, Jesus takes great joy whenever he finds someone that will receive the invitation that needs a lot of forgiveness. But sometimes we use that as an excuse. And sadly... That's something that Satan will whisper into our ear. Sometimes we'll have the idea, well, this is too good to be true. That had to be what these people were thinking. This is too good to be true for him to invite us to this type of a banquet. But they believed, and they went to the feast, and they found out that they were welcome. Yes, God is love, but he also gets angry because it is an insult to God when people reject his son for lesser things. God wants people to spend eternity in heaven with them. He doesn't want the saving work of the cross that's already been done to go to waste. So when rejected, God will take the invitation and give it to someone else. And it leads me to the main point of today's message, which is this. When opportunity knocks for salvation, you better not reject your invitation. And here's why. If the gospel has been presented to you and you understood and were convicted of sin, but you rejected your invitation to be saved, the door may well be shut on you and you may never receive another invitation. Let, let me put it this way. If you, because it's been presented to you today, it's been clear, it's been concise. If you reject your invitation to be saved today, that door may be shut on you, and you may never get that opportunity ever again. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call on him while he is near. The implication is, is that you can't just call on him any time you want. There has to be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Now is the day of salvation. What the, what the, the Bible is teaching us this morning is, is when you are convicted of your sin and you realize that Jesus is the way to have your sin forgiven, that is the Holy Spirit convicting you and God drawing you to him. And if you do not accept it then, there may not be another opportunity. And if you've never been saved, whether you're in the room or you're watching today, opportunity for you is knocking. Christ has done the prep work. And he's inviting you to seize the opportunity. Don't make excuses. Don't walk away from this room or your computer or your phone and say, I'll do it some other time. I'll do it when I get invited next time because there may not be another next time. I, I want to go back to the illustration of the, like the family reunion picnic, and I'll close with this thought. So you get, you get invited. Let's say you're not the host, but you get invited to the family reunion picnic. And, and they take care of everything. All you have to do is show up. And so you show up, and here's this table and all of this food and this, this feast, this banquet that's been prepared. And you can see the food, and you can smell the food, and you can see someone across from you eating the food. And you believe in the cooks that prepared the food. None of those things do you one bit of good. The only thing that does you any good is when you take the food and you receive the food within. I fear, and I think I, I talked a little bit about this last week, I fear that there may be people that they've, they've gone to church so many times and they've heard the gospel message so many times and they believe in the gospel and they believe in the Bible and they believe in the pastor that, that teaches them. And they assume that being around the food is good enough to sustain them. And it is not. You must take it and receive it within. And that's my challenge to you today. Will you seize this opportunity that is knocking for you today to give your life to Jesus Christ to be saved? Would you bow your head to close your eyes with me this morning? 
If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never accepted the invitation to be saved, to have your sin forgiven by what Christ did on the cross, won't it be today? Please don't put it off another day because there may not be another invitation. If you're willing to not miss this opportunity, then pray this with me this morning. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I need Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. I believe he did all the work. And he has invited me today. And I want to accept his invitation to be saved. So today I give my life to Jesus. Help me to live for him for the rest of my life. If it is your desire today, truly that your heart's desire to give your life to Christ, and if you will confess your sin like we just did in that prayer, Jesus will save you. Don't miss this opportunity. And I'll just close with this thought. If you know Christ as your Savior, in that parable, you are the servants. And the host, the, the, the one that prepared, that did the prep work, sent out the servants with the invitations. We have a responsibility to send the invitations to our family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, to let them know that Jesus died to save them. So let's be about getting that invitation out to others. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord. We thank you for what Christ did on the cross, making salvation possible. I pray that there would not be anyone that is in this room or watching today that has heard the gospel message that will reject it. God, I pray that they will give their life to Jesus today for forgiveness of sin to be saved. We'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name.